we no longer really can sleep in the same bed together <laughs> at night because he makes so much noise. <laughs> And I'm a very light sleeper. I feel so guilty that we're not sharing the same bed every night, but I, I don't really know what the right answer is. Yo, yo, what's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. And I had way too much caffeine this morning. And I've been trying to tone it down for the last few months, but I am running on all cylinders. And I borrowed a few other cylinders chemical cylinders, and they are they are firing all at the same time. I'm so glad you're here on the greatest mental health and marriage and parenting podcast ever, ever, ever conceived. That's not true. None of what I just said is true, but I'm so glad that you're here. On this show, we talk to real people who, man, life is just came for them, right? Like it does for all of us. Marriage issues, dealing with kids, dealing with um, physical stuff, dealing with mental and emotional health, diagnostics, whatever you got going on. And here's my promise on this show. I'll sit with you, and we will figure out what to do next. If you want to be on the show, give me a buzz, 1-844-693-3291. It's 1-844-693-3291. Let's run out to Kimberly in Atlanta, Georgia. What's up, Kimberly? Hey, I'm glad to hear that you're well caffeinated this morning because I'm very sleepy. I am borderline methed, so <laughs> we're, I mean, I'm real close. What's up? So my husband and I have been married for about 25 years, and I'm just trying to determine how we can maintain our, I guess, marital health um, in the fact that we no longer really can sleep in the same bed together (laughs) at night because he makes so much noise, and I'm a very light sleeper. And so I feel so guilty that we're not sharing the same bed every night but I don't really know what the right answer is. Ah, so this is this is like a contentious conversation in the nerd world. Um, so talk to me about the conversations y'all had to get to this point. It, well, so, you know, he obviously feels horrible that, you know, he keeps me awake because of, you know, whatever sounds, you know, snoring or even just like breathing heavily or whatever that he makes. Um, okay, so, you know, he feels I, I want to lean in right guilty. there. I want to lean in right there. Yeah. He feels awful. And yeah, I literally had a conversation with somebody a few days ago, a buddy of mine. And I said, and I quote, and again, this is a very particular person with a very particular set of circumstances. I said, I'll put a thousand dollars on the table that if you cut out grains and sugars for 60 to 90 days, your, your snoring and apnea would, would curb dramatically. And he looked at me and he goes, I know you're exactly right. And so when you tell me um, he feels terrible about it, my next question is always how terrible. Terrible enough to to go to a sleep doctor, terrible enough to start changing things and start trying things, or just terrible like, I feel bad, (laughs) right, and goes right back to it. I mean, you know, I think he'd be willing to go have a sleep study done. Uh, We actually did talk about that just like a month or so ago, and he said he'd be open to it. Um, and it's not even so much snoring. It's just he's a very loud breather at night. Like he's a mouth <laughs> breather at night. So he's just breathing really loud. And I'm such a light sleeper that the slightest sounds wake me up. So then I feel like it's my fault because I don't, you know, I'm I'm just too sensitive. So it's just been it's just been a funny <laughs> thing that's been going on for with us for like the last couple of years. Okay, so here's I'll, I'll I <laughs> there's nothing nothing hotter like erotically. Than looking over at an open mouth to mouth breather, right? Who's half? Who's like cash to the world, and is just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Um, and okay, so that's probably a picture none of us needed in our heads. So, um, I it is funny, and also I'm gonna make it a little more serious. Is that cool? Yes. All right. So serious number one, um, I would be willing to bet. Again, I don't have a lot, but I'd be willing to bet that he is not sleeping continuously for more than four hours a night and maybe tosses and turns and gets a five or six or seven. I would love, love, love for him to go get a Garmin watch and just begin tracking his sleep. Hmm, okay. Because almost, I'll say almost always, a significant amount of the time, there is underlying pathologies, underlying 
And it could be as simple as, as it is in my case, which is uh, for some reason, I got some weird food allergies that my body just does weird things. So in my house, um, my wife, we have a very similar dynamic, except um, I have a wife who's a, that was a researcher. And so she began to just quietly track what, because some nights I would snore and some nights I would sleep like she would have to reach over and touch my chest because she thought I died in my sleep. I was just so yes. out. And yes. um, she began to track it and she landed on three things, beer, pizza, and candy, period. And if I have those three things, I will snore. For some reason, my body swells, does something on the inside. And I used to try to dig out the physiology. I don't care anymore. What I know is those three things are to be tr are true. And when I went and started tracking my sleep, first with a whoop strap and then with the this garment I wear now. Um, by the way, I've got no affiliation with either of those companies. They just, Garmin is just a tremendous product. Um, I noticed that my sleep was was deleterious on those nights. Like it, it was it was half of what it normally is. And so now I know w one thing to be true. If I do, in, if I have a beer with some buddies, if I have some pizza, or if I eat some candy, I am making a conscious choice to snore. I'm also making a conscious choice to sleep in another bedroom. I'm also making a conscious decision to not sleep very well. And I occasionally do that because my time with my friends or my wife or my family or whatever's going on, it's worth that trade. But it is very much in my life, very much an either or. And that's simply because I got so curious, number one. Number two, my wife got curious. Number three, I took very seriously the fact that I was disrupting her life in that, in that way. Yeah. And so I think your husband li sounds like he likes the idea of you having a good night's sleep, but not enough to just go all in. Because I got, I got <laughs> insane about it. Yeah, I think he just thinks that it's something he can't control. Yes, and that's I think not, if that's I were to share true. with him that there is maybe something that can be done about it. A whole uh, bunch. He actually does eat pretty healthy, but at the same time, I'm sure that I could start looking at it and tracking it just to see if there is. Because it, it's like you said, it's not every night. Some nights he sleeps great and I can stay put. And then other nights, you know, he's just ripping and roaring and I'm like, I'm going to the other bedroom. So. I, I, again, I'm not a sleep study guy. I'm a sleep study expert. Um I, I I would be willing to bet there's some some sort of allergic reaction side of him, and I say allergies. I'm speaking very loosely there, not in a clinical sense in any way. But all I have to yeah. say is this: here's where the, there's there's a big discussion back and forth in the nerd world. There are some studies that say over the long haul that sleeping in separate beds does disrupt your sex life, it does disrupt your intimacy life, and it might even have some downstream health consequences. And oh. there's some other studies that say above all else get a good night's sleep. Nothing in your life matters. Um, nothing, nothing you can do in your life matters if it's built on a foundation of less than good sleep. And so in my house, and I, again, this is one of those, like there's no consensus in the literature. So I'm just gonna tell you what I do. Um, probably one night a week, maybe two, I'll sleep in another room because I've made some dumb choice. Um, maybe, nah, that's not true. Maybe once every two weeks, I will I'll, I'll go sleep in the guest room. Yeah, And it's, it's a gift for her. Or it's a gift for me. I also know um, about once a month, maybe twice a month, I will, I'll know about eight o'clock. Like, oh man, <laughs> I'm going to be up till four. I don't know why my body does that. It just does. And I used to fight it and fight it and fight it and medicate. I just don't fight it at all anymore. I just get a lot of work done. It's great. And I make sure I do my workouts um, early that next morning and then my body just adjusts itself. And so I don't fight it anymore. And, but what is important is I want to make sure, um, at least one of us is sleeping good. So I make sure she gets some sleep and she'll tell you, right. um, she does not sleep when I'm snoring and she sleeps at a different level when I'm in, in, in the same bed. And my guess is yeah, you experience that's that too. What I'm missing that's right. because, you know, we used to have that and, you know, and I love that closeness and, you know, just that security feeling. So I, it's just been hard because then, like I said, I feel guilty when I'm not sleeping in there that I'm like, oh, I'm shunning you or whatever. So that's, that's, <laughs> the, it, that's good. <laughs> right now, the greatest gift you could give your husband is a well-rested you. Yeah. The greatest gift he could give you is to really dig in 
and figure out why his body has begun acting the way it has been over the last few um, months, years. Um, I think a, a formal sleep study is great. I think before you would pay the money to go do a formal sleep study, I think it would be fun just to track. I think it'd be fun just to track. And so here's how this would look in your house. You go ahead and set up the guest room as though you're going to sleep in there. And then you get ready and go to bed. And if he wakes you up in the middle of the night, y'all have written down what y'all ate the night before. And it might be as simple as that. It might also be as simple as a meeting coming up that he had or didn't have. I would look at the simplest things first. And I would do anything, anything, to not have pizza and a dark beer and candy slash chips and queso. I would do anything for those four things not to affect my body in that way. But they do. They do. And they don't affect my friends in that same way, which is super annoying. But they do. And that's me choosing reality. I got to live in that. So you, you are not a bad person. You're not, you're, your marriage isn't falling apart. All those, None of that stuff is true. Those are all stories that we got from Leave it to Beaver, right? Um, I don't even know why I said leave it to Beaver, but if you are new to the world, that show is about a thousand years old. Uh, but what's important is y'all decide. I want to sleep in the same bed as you. You want to sleep in the same bed as me. That means we have to get to the bottom of this. We have to figure it out. And let's get very curious and very aware of what's going on. And then if we can't figure that out and over the next two weeks, this doesn't take a long time. Like this is, this is a couple of weeks. Then let's go get a formal sleep study. Let's go figure that out. Let's go see if there's something with jaw alignment or with the way my my pillow works. I mean, there's any number of things. Um, but almost always underneath like a sudden, and I say the last couple of years, a sudden snoring, sudden deep breathing. You start heading into sleep apnea, that waking up and going to sleep, waking up, going to sleep. You're getting into some underlying pathology that your body's just trying to get your attention about. And it's just good to go get checked out. It's good to go get it checked out. But this all starts with you sitting down with your husband saying, I've been getting some sleep, but I miss you. Would you be willing to not just talk about it, but let's get very, very serious about figuring out what's happening to your body at night. And let's see if we can figure that out. And it might cost you ah, your nightly bowl of ice cream, and it might cost you that glass of wine, it might cost you whatever, but am I worth it? <laughs> Don't do that. That would be mean. But I mean, also do that. All right, thanks for the call. You're awesome. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks, Dr. John Deloney here. Can we all just take a minute to take a deep breath? <sighs> There's a lot going on, especially in the economy. You're hearing words like recession, continued inflation thrown around, and it's making your stress levels spike. I don't care who you are. But remember, we've been through seasons like this before. And the best thing you can do is focus on controlling what you can control. You can control your spending and saving. You can. You can control your daily habits. You can. And you can control making time for sleep. And this one is easy to forget, especially when you're stressed. But sleep is key to taking care of your physical and mental health. And I found that the key to good sleep starts with an incredible mattress. And that's why I love DreamCloud mattresses. They're incredibly comfortable. And right now, DreamCloud is making it easy to invest in good sleep with their biggest offer yet, 40% off all mattresses plus an additional $50 in savings exclusively for my listeners. Go to dreamcloudsleep.com slash Deloney or dreamcloudsleep.com and enter promo code John Deloney to get your new mattress and start sleeping today. All right, let's go out to Charlotte and talk to Pam, which is map backwards. What's up, Pam? How are we doing? Uh, not much. Just hanging in there. Very cool. Aren't we all right? What's up? <laughs> Oh, well, I've been having some difficulty sticking with, uh, for lack of a better word, ultimatums that I've been trying with my husband who has a mental illness. Oh, ultimatums are never great. They're never good. Yeah. What ultimatums did you put down? Well, uh, so he has agoraphobia. He's not left our house at all for uh, three years. Oh. And it wouldn't be so bad except for, like, he he also wants to keep me and our kids at home. Yeah, that's yeah. Yikes. Um, so we've we, yeah, that's we, not. Good. We've had several showdowns about it, yeah. and I'm always the one who backs down. You've been in prison for three years. Yes. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. No. No, your kids can't do that either. No. Um. 
yeah, you need to make a call on this ASAP. There yeah. is, um, so for those listening, agoraphobia, it's technically classified as an anxiety disorder, but agoraphobia, agoraphobia is initially a fear of large crowds, right? When I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation and it increasingly tightens your circle and you may experience or imagine panic attacks and then over time, if un, untreated and undealt with, and by the way, especially up front, it's not a hard, um, it's not a hard, um, mental health challenge to, to overcome. I mean, it's pretty systematic. Um, but over time, untreated agoraphobics, they won't leave their house. They won't, they'll, they'll shut the door, lock the door. They will draw the, the curtains. And then where it gets really dire is when they trap loved ones in the house too. And that sounds like where y'all are at, right? Yeah, well, we're living this kind of half-life where uh, I'll go to my parents' house with the kids for a few weeks, and then we'll go back home. And then he set up, we have a two-story home, so he set up like a, a, basically an apartment with a makeshift kitchen. Y'all are not, for us for yeah, two y'all, weeks. y'all aren't even married. Uh, we, we are for uh, two weeks every month and a half <laughs> when, I mean, he, when he's done hiding from us, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean... That's not marriage. Is he unwilling to go get go get help? Uh, he's he's tried, so he's on a team six. And then if they want him to leave the house or, or push say, him say, too hard, say that one more time. I, I missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. He's he's on attempt six of getting help, or he's he's reached out to a mental health professional, but for whatever reason, he's always backed out yeah. before. So he's not getting yeah. help. Yeah. No. Um, and he's unwilling. What is, what is the, what is his narrative? Uh, so, so he has OCD, mm-hmm. uh, contamination. And so his, his narrative is that if he gets sick, he's going to, he's going to die and that he's protecting us. And that whenever we do anything normal, you know, go to the park, we're risking illness ourselves. Yeah. To what does life and death. what does he? Yeah, and that it, I want people to hear that with an agoraphobic, especially somebody who's man. You throw an OCD on top of that, which, by the way, I'm I'm still in the camp that those are those are are similar. I know there's some neurological differences there, but I think the trajectory from anxiety to OCD and back um, are pretty tightly wound um, or are braided together there. Um, but it is life or death. So if you see, um, like you're about to step and a rattlesnake is about to strike you, and I'm talking to people who are listening here, um, not to you, Pam, but if, if you are about to step on a rattlesnake or a car is coming at you and it's 10 feet away, that's the feeling that, that he gets when he's about to go outside. Or when y'all have been at the park or been at a, at a grocery store and you come just bebopping back in the house. Um, how old are your kids? Four and a half and two. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, you have to make some hard calls here quick, Pam. And I know that you know that, but I just want to reaffirm you're not crazy and your husband's worthy of being loved and all that. But you can't do this much longer and those kids cannot be pinned up and they're, they cannot have their nervous system wired and it already is down the road especially for your oldest one, that they are somehow a contamination to their dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that they, I mean, it's, it's for a child's nervous system to be in the same room or the same vicinity. That's why COVID was so awful for folks who had to go upstairs for two weeks in quarantine and their little kids are downstairs and they just couldn't wrap their head around it. And that this isn't just for two weeks. This is for ever in your home. And my guess is this this tends to escalate. So it just slowly moves. Is that how this has been going for the last several years? Uh, kind of a bit on a, a bell curve. Or okay. It escalated, escalated, and then you know he 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 got a little better. He got a little looser on things. Uh, mostly, I have to kind of just say no and stand up to him. And so, you know, he, he's loosened up quite a bit, you know, but that, that's, um, anybody outside looking in wouldn't even notice that he's, he's loosened up and he's gotten better. Um, 
What's your relationship with your parents? Meaning, could you move in on a permanent basis for a season? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's, here's the way I want you to think of this. At the end of the day, not that your husband has chosen agoraphobia, not that your cho- husband has chosen anxiety or OCD. He has chosen up until now, and I know it can also be a function of the illness, so I'm not cold-hearted and evil or all that. But he has chosen to not pursue care. And he hasn't had to. Mm. And so, um, at the end of the day, you have to choose what's best for you and your children. And you know, as well as I do, this scenario is not sustainable and it's not good for your kids and it's not good for you. And so there will be a lot of grief. There will be a lot of guilt. There will be a lot of um, trying to figure out what comes next and who knows what comes next. But this isn't about ultimatums. This is about health, the health of you and your kids. Yeah, I guess because he always phrases it as an ultimatum when I talk to him about it. That's the way he does. That's 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 how yeah. he keeps uh, his hooks in you. Yeah, you're not giving him an ultimatum. What you're going to do from this point forward is do the things that you need to do to stay well and whole. Mm-hmm. And that is, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be held a prisoner in my own home. I just won't be. Our children are going to go out and play with other kids. Because they have to have that for neurological development. Our kids are going to go outside and get sunshine and have different adventures. And they're going to have different tactile experiences, lateral, horizontal. Uh, They're going to do all of these things for their neural development, not stay locked inside this house watching TV, period. Your dream and hope, and I hope you communicate this to him. My dream and hope is that... And I will go every step of the way with you, if you'll have me. Um, My dream and hope is that you will begin ASAP to get the mental health care that you need. Because for agoraphobia, for OCD, for for hyper-anxiety disorders, there's significant help available. Yeah. There is. And for agoraphobia specifically, now he sounds like he's really far down the road. Has he had started the panic attack process yet? Uh, not that, not that I've seen. He, okay. it's mostly just like not sleeping is, is where I see it. Like not abil- ability, not to sleep where I see it kind of. And I have, I have a working hypothesis that I may be crazy on, but I have a, a hypothesis that my anxiety did not get super, super, super bad. Like, ir- like irrationally bad. I've always been uh, just, just hypersensitive like uh able to read a room able to know like oh there's about to be a fight like I, i've I, it's always i've been that way since I was a little kid but my anxiety didn't get out of control until i spent several years taking hypnotic sleep medications because i was training um mixed martial arts and from 8 to 10 p.m i'd get home really late and then i could just take this thing and it would knock me out what i didn't realize over time was i was not sleeping my body was not getting restored to sleep i was just unconscious through this medication. And I thought I had hacked the system, right? And so it was several years of not sleeping well that I spun out. And so it may be, and again, we're talking chicken or the egg here, but I'm wondering what six or seven weeks of deep black hole sleep, not hip, not hypnosis and not unconsciousness, but of sleep would do to his ability to think rationally about what comes next. Mm. Yeah, and he has to choose that. And let me be super clear. I quit my job. We took a $70,000 household income pay cut. We moved. I did all kinds of things that were radical and insane at the time. I turned down a vice presidency. I did a lot of stuff because I loved my wife and I loved my kids and I didn't want this. I didn't want this anymore. And so I tell you that to tell you, it, it might take huge sacrifices. And I'm here more than a decade later and every single inch of my life, every single corner of my life is different. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, dude, I'm no superhero, but my wife laid down some really firm boundaries and she was right to do so. What's your, what is your hang up? 
Uh, I, I guess just lots of guilt for, for leaving him, leaving him in it. Mm-hmm. Is you staying in it doing anything positively to help him? Uh, at this point, I don't think so. I don't either. What about the guilt you should have towards yourself? Or the guilt you should have towards your kids that are seeing all this? Yeah, so it's it's it's, it's just a... A lot of not feeling great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's what I'm trying to get you. Um, I wrote about this in this new book. There's only a hard path. Mm. It's hard to, to sit down with your parents and say, we're going to move in for six months. We're, we're going to try a six month separation here. And you could tell your husband, I'm not interested in divorcing you. I'm not. But I can no longer sit in this home while you drown in isolation and loneliness. Yeah. I can't. I can't watch you do that. And I especially am not going to let our four-year-old and two-year-old watch you do this. And so I'm going to get them community. I'm going to get them sunshine. I'm going to get them activity. I'm going to go see a counselor because this has been really hard on me the last three years, watching my husband slowly suffocate inside his own house, our own house. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're, I'm going to live here for 90 days, for three months, for six months. The moment you need a ride to go see a mental health professional, I will be there. Yeah. That, right? So this isn't abandonment. This is, at this point, you've made, you're, you've, you're continuing down this path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to make sure that me and, and my, our two little kids are okay. Because that's my job. Yeah. That's my job. And I want you to make sure your picture of what a marriage is, Oh, let me go back. You've got two hard paths. Leaving will be hard. Um, being a single mom for a season with your parents will be hard. There'll probably be some I told you so's and all that. Some where's daddy, all that stuff. And staying in this current psychosis, like sitting in this dark house upstairs where you're, I mean, it's just madness, right? When you say it out loud, you're like, is this my life? That's hard. <laughs> That's hard too. So the, yeah. you have you have a hard path either way. Take the one that's going to lead you towards healing. Mm -hmm. Take the one that's going to be safest for your kids. Does that make sense? You hear what I'm saying? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing you've done up till now is working. Let's try something completely different. And be prepared for the guilt. Be prepared for his um, gaslighting and, oh my gosh, you abandoned me. You left me. You're the worst when I needed you most. All that stuff. You know that's coming, yeah. right? Yeah, that's the stuff that gets me. Of course. Yeah. You know, so you know that it is a person that's him saying, I don't want to actually make the call to the professional. I don't want to call the fire department to put this fire out. I just want you to sit with me and get burned too. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it. And I'm not going to get burned anymore. Mm-hmm. I would go in that fire and get you if it was to get you out and get you to the professionals that can help. But you don't want that right now. And that's okay. You're an adult. You get to do that. I'm going to be heartbroken and sick over watching my, my, the man I love go through this and not accept anybody's help. But also, I'm not going to sit in the fire with you anymore. Right. And uh, hear me say this, agoraphobia, it's, there's desensitization where they, they have you imagine things, they have you draw a picture of things, and they sit with you and they teach you some skills. And then there's usually panic attacks involved and they teach you to work through those. But we're not talking, and then you you roll off into cognitive behavioral therapy at some point. I mean, we're not talking a complex process out of this. Okay. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is him choosing, like, I don't want this life anymore. And I don't know what to do. It feels insane. I feel like I'm going to die. All those things are true. I'm not saying this is easy or trivial by any means. Yeah, yeah. I, I I believe he doesn't want to get help because he's he's afraid that getting help will expose him to what he thinks is going to kill him. And here's the deal: yeah. in his mind, he's exactly right. Yeah. How, how does how does he make money? Oh, that's that's the crazy thing. He runs uh, three successful businesses from the house with employees and everything. None of his friends know how sick he is. He's like super high functioning business guy. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> So, yeah. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. 
Good for him. Can't check the mail, but you know. <laughs> that was kind of a dig, but I appreciate it. I like a good dig. <laughs> yeah, I make six figures and can't go check the mail. But, I mean, that's that's yeah. a that's a function, right? Of Jesus, Louise. Yeah, I hate that for him. I hate that for everybody involved. I hate it for everybody involved. Yeah. Um, but let's let's go back and he doesn't want to call nine one one. His house is on fire. And he doesn't want to call nine one one. He just wants you to sit with him and hold his hand. And if you get up and say, I'm tired of getting burned, you're the bad guy. You're not. You're not the bad guy. You're not the bad guy. I don't think he's a bad guy. And he has enough working in his life that he has not been forced with, uh, faced with an either or. So he's been able to keep his money coming in, his work from home, his imaginary leadership with employees, a virtual, and his marriage in some weirdly constructed Two weeks here, you do this, I'm going over here, you go over there. Weirdness. Um, he's been able to keep all the plates spinning. And this is when you come in and say, I'm, I'm getting off. I'm not on your plates anymore. I'm going over here until you choose to get well. And he's going to feel like he's walking through hell. And for his body, he will be. And you're worth that. And so are those little kids. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you a copy of Building a Non-Anxious Life. This is y'all's world. And this is what comes next. And these are the aspects when he sits down and after going through the exposure therapy, um, he is going to uh, have to create a new world. Y'all are gonna have to create a new world together. And this is your roadmap, building a non-anxious life. All of y'all are worth more than this. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks, Deloney here with some great news. You get to choose whatever you do, Good or bad, moving forward, the choice is yours. And when you're intentional about making good choices over time, those become healthy habits. They almost become automatic. Like choosing to slow down and make time for a daily practice of prayer and meditation. One thing that has helped me with my daily practice is Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world, and they're giving you three free months to get started. That's three months for free to prioritize your mental and spiritual health and be intentional about finding peace through calming music, through guided prayers, meditation, and more. And by the way, Hallow isn't just Catholic. You can tailor the content towards your faith tradition. Or if you don't have a faith tradition, it's a great place to start. From scripture readings to prayers to journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice mindfulness, build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life, and choose peace. Remember, Hallow is giving you 90 days free. Imagine the peaceful habits you can establish in 90 days. Go to hallow.com slash Deloney today to start your free trial. Just follow the simple prompts at hallow.com slash Deloney for 90 days free. All right, let's go out to Los Angeles, the city of angels, and talk to Justin. What's up, Justin? How we doing? Hey, Dr. Dolly. How's it going? It's an honor to be talking with you. We're partying, man. It's an honor to talk to you, dude. What's up? Yeah, so my situation, um, basically, so ever since I was a kid, um, ever since I was little, my dream was to uh, was to become an airline pilot. Um, and so I kind of pursued that dream, uh, went to college. After college, became a commercial pilot and flight instructor. Uh, but then due to some medical and mental health stuff, I actually wasn't able to continue past that. And, um, since really flying was my identity, it, it kind of put me in a rough spot for a while, really felt like I had kind of lost my purpose. Um, and it's, it's, it's gotten better since then. I've been going to, I had gone to some counseling and I'm enjoying what I'm doing now, but it still pops up here and there. And I've, I've kind of found myself, um, like whenever I drive by an airport, I, I start feeling pretty low and it feels like kind of, I'm going back to square runs uh, to square one. So I guess my question overall is, uh, how I can kind of begin to fully let it go and move on and embrace what's ahead. Yeah, man. Thanks for the call. So, um, what put this picture in your head as a kid? Just curious. Yeah, I, I've, I've thought about that. It, I mean, nobody in my family were pilots or anything like that. It was just something that I've always kind of been into everything that moves trains, planes, boats, and, um, planes just caught my eye and that's kind of what drew me toward it from a mm. young age. Mm. Yeah. I, um, was recently sitting down with somebody and we were kind of doing some, mining of, of my past. And 
it occurred to me that my dad used to really talk positive. So my dad, you know, was a hostage negotiator for the SWAT team. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a psychologist on staff, like a staff psychologist with the, with the police department that was kind of over everything. And my dad used to talk about that guy with reverence. Mm -hmm. Like we would be, he'd say like, we were dealing with issue, 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 issue. We'd call him and wake him up in the middle of the night and tell him, he'd go, just ask him this. And we'd always ask him. And then he would just, the guy was, that was about to jump would just come down or the guy who had a bomb would just, would just walk out the front door. And so I had to wonder, man, I always heard my dad talk about this one guy with such reverence. Is that the tiny mustard seed of you should be in mental health? And then your dad will think he's, it, your dad will be proud of you too. And I just wondered. And so I always love to ask that question. Where is that seed, especially from a young age, um, who in your life or what in your life planted that seed, but who knows what it is, right? I just wondered if you were like, no, my dad used to be a pilot or he used to talk how amazing pilots were or my mom. Anyway, my mom, a pilot saved my mom's life or anything. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, I haven't found anything like that that I can think of. It was just more of the fact that I loved airplanes and everything like that. So that's very cool. All right. So what's the medical issue, man? What happened? Well, yeah. So it, it started with, um, well, it started I was flying one time, um, just by myself. I was building, building some hours for one of my certificates and, um, just out of nowhere, really out of nowhere, my, my toes, my fingers all started going tingly and numb. Um, and I started to kind of, my, my vision started to go away and I, I really thought like I was going to black out and that was going to be it right there. Um, and I, I remember, yeah, it was, that was just the, that was the first instance of it. And so I thought it was carbon monoxide poisoning from, um, from the airplane, but it turns out that was not the case. I went to see some doctors and it's a panic attack. Um, that's, that's what they had told me that it most likely was. Yeah. yeah. And so those started coming back and I had a whole bunch of those and I ended up finishing the program successfully. But after that, it was, I was kind of left at this crossroads as like, you know, as, as a flight instructor, my primary responsibility is going to be to ensure the safety of the whoever's in my airplane. And if I can't do that right now. It's just not really going to be the, option. So did you take yourself out? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. Can yeah. I give you an alternative hypothesis? Yeah, absolutely. There's the obvious loss, man. You put your whole life into this and you trained for it. You got certified in it. You had this vision of this life. You became an instructor, right? I mean, this was your world. Mm -hmm. But there's also another component when your body betrays you. Yeah. And that's the part underneath the job. That's the part underneath the identity part where suddenly just walking on two feet becomes unstable because the one thing that you rely on every day failed you. In your eyes, it yeah. failed you. Yeah. Yeah. That to me is the core angst because I don't yeah. trust me anymore. If I don't trust me, I can't trust anybody, anything at all. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, that's definitely fair. So my question for you would be, what's the core anxiety underneath this? Because panic attack is your body trying to get you. Basically, a panic attack is your, your body saying, hey, you haven't listened to us. We're out. <laughs> I quit. Um, yeah. What's, under, what's the core anxiety underneath that? Yeah, that's, um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's, I think that's the question I'm kind of seeking answers for as well. Uh, cause yeah, it, it tends to, it's been a while since I've had one, but they would always tend to happen when not in places where I didn't feel in control, but in times where I felt that if it happened, then it would be in worst case scenario. So flying obviously is when it would, they would start to happen the most and then driving, they would happen pretty often too. Other than that, it would, it never seemed to affect my life in, in ways other than that, I guess. But there's, my guess is there's an underlying so think of it this way. You have a cup, like a glass, and mm -hmm. it can take a lot. It can take, you are got to be at work on time. You got a wife that's, that's hassling you about something. You got a kid that's got the flu. You've got mom and dad who are telling you what you're doing for Christmas. It's got all these things, and, and, and it's, each one of them is putting like um, drops of water in this glass. And it fills up and up and up. And you got that car payment you got to make. And you got that soccer coach telling you that your kid's going to be the one, but he, you're going to have to have, pay for private lessons. And you get this exam tomorrow for your licensure. All this stuff just keeps going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And then your f glass is completely full. And then you get in a plane and you know, more so than the people in the plane, that you're super jittery and you didn't sleep. 
and you had 19 cups of coffee to get the day going. And then the, the, the thought machine kicks up. And so what I want you to look at it is not the, about the thought machine. That thought machine is trying to keep you safe. That panic attack is trying to keep you safe. I want to go underneath it and say, what in your life is filling up your glass so tall mm. that when stress comes, which I hope, honestly, I hope my pilots, I have a lot of flights coming up here. I'll be traveling a lot. I hope all my pilots are a little bit angsty. <laughs> Not, I don't want them to have anxiety disorders, but I want them all to be like, hey, we need to do this right. I don't want them just cruising, yeah. man, you know? So I want 100%. you to be like, all right, we're got focused, we're lasered in, not like, oh, man, did you see the game last night? Because in my head, yeah. that just means we're all going to have, we're all going to wreck. And so my question for you is, how's your underlying health? How's your underlying relationships? How is um, your underlying autonomy? Who, who runs your life? How's yeah. your marriage? It's, these are questions I want to get to the bottom of because if you have an empty glass or a glass that's very, very um, small, here's, here's the story I love to tell from the stage. When my cousin died suddenly, like, man, it was awful. And my wife and I booked plane tickets and we got a hotel in Houston. We flew home. We were never anxious. Man, I was sad. I be, be, but because my glass is empty most of the time, I don't owe anybody any money. I don't, I work really, I see a counselor regularly. I work on my marriage really hard. I always try to be a better dad. Like, because I'm not anxious, when bad stuff happens, there's enough space in that glass for me to accept whatever water gets dumped into it. And my body doesn't shut us down because it's prepared. So you see what, you see the analogy I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe it's none of those things. I think more the the thought that I come back to the most, I really think is the is the idea that I'm like not where I thought I would be. Like I guess when it pops up, I guess when I when I see pictures of friends that I was in flight school with who are now making it to the airlines, and I I feel that sense of um I don't even really know how to describe it, but that's that's kind of, I mean that's where I see it the most. It's just jealousy, and that, that's totally normal. I'd be jealous, yeah. right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. But I also think in the short term, you did a really noble thing opting out. Because you could have got through flight school and got up in a plane and no one would have known what you were feeling in your shoes. Fair? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. No one would have known until you blacked out and left that other pilot all by himself. So for me, the figuring out what is that underlying anxiety about? Because the trainers, the certifiers, the instructors, they believe in you. Those who have ridden with you before, they believe in you. Your students have believed in you. The one thing that doesn't believe in you is your body for some reason. Yeah. And I'd want to get to the core of that. The second piece on the alternative, what are you doing now? Um, I work, I work for a nonprofit and I'm also going back to, back to school. What are you doing there? Um, at the nonprofit? No, 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 no. Going back to school for what? I'm getting a master's in counseling. Ah, there you go. Okay. So have you gone to your own therapy? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. And you haven't got to the bottom of the anxiety? Y yeah. I, it doesn't. Yeah. I guess it doesn't seem like we have. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, yeah. Come on, counselors. I, I, yeah. Come on, counselors. Um, hmm. I guess I thought I was. I thought, yeah. I guess I thought I was farther past this than I am realizing now. Just I guess with things that keep popping up. So when people get cancer. When people end up with a brain tumor, when people um, who are star athletes blow their knee out, there is a, it's different than a Formula One driver whose car wrecks on them. Because they, there's a gap between that car and them. When your body fails you, it's devastating. 
Because if I can't, again, because if I can't rely on my body, good God, man. And there's always a coming back around that yeah, for the next five years, we are going to go to the doctor and see if we're cancer, if, if cancer is still undetectable. Is it undetectable? Is it undetectable? And there's that apprehension. There's that, that um, anxiousness. And that's good. That's right. Because your body let you down. In, 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 this, in this analogy, right? I don't think globally it lets you down, but um, the picture you had was we were going to do this thing and your body's like, we're not going to do that. Yeah. And so I think there is a, there will be some, it will take time to make peace with, that's not for me. Or in this season, that wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Are you done flying forever? Can you never do it again? Yeah, I, I think, Probably. I, it's hard to answer at this point, but, but yeah, I think so. Why? I mean, I, I mean, unless I can get to a point where I know for certain I can do it safely, I wouldn't want to. You can only that do risk. that in the air. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And is the thought of getting back up in the air just terrify you? Does that, shut, does that yeah. sh- get that warm feeling it, in your guts? Yeah, and it it really did ever since because when that when it first happened, that was still months away from when I was finished, and so really ever since that ever since that day, getting back in there um, was pretty tough, mm-hmm. and and that even that that was when I had somebody else with me, um, and so going back by my by myself, I just I don't know how I just don't know how my body would react to that. All right, here's what I want you to do. And if your therapist can't do this, I want you to find somebody in your local community who can do this. And out there in California, I promise you can find this. I want somebody to do either EMDR or somebody Mm -hmm. to do some sort of body work with you. And body work is sometimes they hold your hand, they put their hand on your shoulder, they put your hand on the back of your head while you are laying down and while you're sitting down while you tell what happened. And you're... you process those feelings as though they have as they happened again but you do it in the safety of somebody else's space okay okay and what it does is it eventually discharges that that trauma that's held in your body Hmm. and it might be an overuse of the word but feeling like your body failed you is a core trauma trauma means i'm separate from myself and feeling like I can't take this step because my knee's going to blow out on me again, feeling like I can't do something hard because last time I did, my body almost shut me down in the like 30,000 feet in the air is that's, that's the, that's the trauma, right? And every time you think about it, your body remembers the past and it drags it into the present. And so we have to unhook our response from that. You weren't safe then you're, you're great now. Now let's figure out what that is. And dude, it's okay to be jealous. It's okay to be like, ah, oh, they did it. I didn't. That's okay. You're not broken or crazy. You need to grieve that. I would love to see you take some autonomy. I mean, some ownership, some autonomy. Some, um, not autonomy. That's the wrong word. I want you to take some ownership. Here's what this is. I want you to write Justin the pilot a letter. And I want you to say, dear Justin the pilot, we were supposed to be flying today. And be very specific. And I chose to not fly. I chose a different life path. I chose health and healing. I chose fill in the blank. And I want you to begin to not be subjected to a body that you don't trust. I want you to take ownership of that body again. And in a weird way, anxiety tends to follow the leader. And if the leader is firm and committed and taking ownership, anxiety says, we don't have to ring the alarms because that guy's driving. It's when your body thinks, dude, he's not paying attention. He's not paying attention. Then it will start shutting you down. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I think there's a lot of grieving you haven't done yet. I think you may have talked with a counselor for a while and y'all just talked and how does it make you feel and how does that make you feel? But let's get in and do the hard work, which is we're going to grieve this thing. I'm going to take ownership of it. Because you weren't kicked out. Your body said we're out and then you did a noble thing and you walked away. And so you made a choice. And now you're making a choice to go be a mental health counselor, which is awesome. We need some more great counselors out there. And you're going to make a choice to get to the core anxiety and you're going to make a choice to release your body from responding to this nonsense every time 
you think about a pilot or every time you see a plane fly over, every time you're about to get on a plane and your body goes whoosh and drops and that, that slow motion feeling, we're going to be done with that now. I'm going to go process. I'm going to go back to that feeling, back to that moment, and I'm going to free my body from it. And by the way, we're going to get to, what in the world was my body so scared of? I landed the plane. The teacher said I did great. My schooling said I did great. They certified me and everything. What is my body so scared of? And my guess is you're going to find something in your environment that's much, much bigger. Somebody who didn't believe in you for a long period of time and cast a narrative into you that became part of your nervous system or you're lonely or you don't take care of your body or any number of things. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you a copy of Building a Non-Anxious Life as well. I want you to read that book and see if any of that rings true. But my guess is there's a deeper well here. There's a deeper picture. And I don't want to put, um, I don't want to put hope where you have put something to bed, but... And you get to this core anxiety, maybe you're back up there flying again. Or maybe you deal with that core anxiety and a couple years from now when you're a licensed counselor, you're sitting across the, the, the room from somebody and you're able to look into their eyes and say, I've been there too. I've been there too. I'm proud of you, man. You did a hard, hard thing. And you have a hard um, road to go into the future and you can do it. You can do it. We'll be right back. Hey, Dr. John Deloney here. I'm super jazzed to announce my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, is now available for pre-order. Listen, we all experience some level of anxiety or stress or burnout every day, but most of us don't know how to recognize it, let alone deal with it. And here's the good news. Anxiety doesn't have the last word. I know this because I've sat with thousands of you, and I know this because I've been there too. If you create a life of intentionally living out the six daily choices I've outlined in this book, you'll be able to better respond at whatever life throws at you. This book will help you learn practical steps to overcome anxiety. Plus, when you pre-order the book now, I'm going to give you something to help you today. That's why you'll instantly get my newest talk, Smoke, Fire, and Freedom, where I break down the misunderstandings and myths we believe about anxiety, how to reclaim your freedom, and how to build a non-anxious life. So pre-order Building a Non-Anxious Life today for just 20 bucks at johndeloney.com. All right, as we wrap up today's show, finally, Kelly's out today, and there's good music. Well done, Jenna. The great and powerful Smiths. I love the Smiths, man. I love the Smiths. Song's called Asleep. I'm, I'm assuming this is a shout-out to the first caller? Of course, yes. Of course. Are you a Smiths fan? Actually, Andrew over here picked it. I knew it. Andrew rules. Andrew rules. Where are you on that one, Jenna? You should get an associate producer credit on this show today. Way to go, Andrew. Song's called Asleep, and it goes like this. Sing me to sleep. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Sing me to sleep, and then leave me alone. Don't try to wake me in the morning, because I'll be gone. Don't feel bad for me. I want you to know deep in the cell of my heart, I feel so glad to go. I don't want to wake up on my own anymore. Sing to me. I don't even know what they're talking about at this point. <laughs> like, I want to go to sleep. Leave me alone. I want to come back. Let's be friends. Actually, this sounds more like Jenna than I care to admit. It's all good. Love you guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye.